Good afternoon. Um, my name is Bill Summers, uh, and on behalf of uh, Yale University and the, uh, my fellow members of the Terry Lectureship Committee, uh, I welcome you to this uh, series of Terry Lectures on Islam, Science, and the Challenge of History to be presented by Professor Ahmad Dalal. Uh, the uh, Dwight H. Terry Lectureship was established at Yale in 1905 uh, by a gift from Dwight Harrington T Terry of Bridgeport, Connecticut. Uh, the deed of gift uh, from Mr. Terry declares that the object of this foundation is not the promotion of scientific investigation and discovery, but rather the assimilation uh, to uh, an interpretation of what has been or shall hereafter be discovered and its application to human welfare, um, especially by the building of the truths of science and philosophy into the structure of a broadened and purified religion. The founder uh, believes that such a religion will greatly stimulate intelligent effort for the improvement of human conditions and the advancement of the race in strength and excellence of character. To this end, it is desired that a series of lectures be given by men eminent in their respective departments on ethics, the history of civilization and religion, biblical research, all sciences and branches of knowledge which have been important in, on, in bearing on this subject, and the great laws of nature, especially of evolution. Well, the uh, lectures have had an enduring permanence through their publication in book form by the Yale University Press. And uh, for more immediate engagement um, of the material uh, in this series, there is an interactive um, website that um, uh, allows you both to pose questions and have discussion, as well as to review the lecture, which will be available online. The URL for that website is uh, www.yale.edu uh, backslash Terry Lecture. Right after the, the talk, there will be a reception uh, out in the hall there where we can have uh, informal conversations, and I welcome you all to stay. Professor Dalal earned his uh, bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering uh, from the American University of Beirut and worked as an engineer while developing his knowledge of culture and uh, science under the tutelage of Professor Edward Kennedy, uh, the renowned scholar of Arabic astronomy and mathematics. Uh, Professor Dalal received his PhD in Islamic studies from Columbia University and has held faculty positions at Smith, Yale, uh, Stanford, uh, before taking his present position at uh, Georgetown University, where he is the chair of the uh, Arabic and Islamic Studies Department. Uh, Professor Dalal tells me that uh, while at Yale, he's lectured in this hall himself, and so we welcome him back to uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, venue. Uh, his academic training and research covers the history of the disciplines of learning in the Muslim societies, including both the exact and traditional sciences, as well as modern and early modern Islamic thought and movements. Um, Professor Dalal arrives in New Haven uh, from Morocco, where he's engaged in a year-long research project uh, as a Carnegie uh, scholar. Um, his lectures uh, in this series, which are four in number, uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays of this week and next uh, are on the general topic, Islam, Science, and the Challenge of History. And it's a real pleasure to uh, welcome back uh, uh, my colleague and friend and uh, our lect Terry Lecture for the year, Ahmad Dalal. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Bill. Uh, it's an honor to be here, uh, to be invited uh, to give the Terry Lectures, and I would like to thank the Terry Lectureship Committee for uh, giving the, me this honor. It's also a great pleasure to be back with colleagues. Uh, I spent six years at Yale, and uh, they were great years, and I learned so much. Uh, and it's always a pleasure to be back. Muslims are enjoined to face Mecca during their five daily prayers. And all mosques are supposed to be oriented toward the Kaaba in Mecca, the cubical structure in Mecca or what is known as the direction of the Qibla. Before mathematical methods became available to them, Muslims determined the direction of the Qibla based on the practices of the early companions of the Prophet and uh, their successors. They also made use of traditions of folk astronomy and of the fact that the Kaaba itself is astronomically oriented. These methods provided reasonable approximations in locations close to Mecca, such as uh, Hijaz and Syria and Iraq, but were quite inaccurate in faraway places like North Africa and Iran. With the emergence of mathematical sciences, 
new mathematical methods of considerable sophistication were devised to compute the Qibla for any locality on the basis of the geographical coordinates of that locality and of Mecca. In the most accurate solution, the problem is transferred to the celestial sphere, where the position of the zenith of Mecca relative to the zenith of the locality is determined. The direction of the Qibla is then calculated as the azimuth of the zenith of Mecca on the local horizon. Most astronomical handbooks contain chapters on finding the direction of the Qibla by one or more approximative of or accurate method. And separate treatises were also composed on the subject. In his many works on astronomy in the, in the service of Islam, David King has noted that although jurists and scientists often proposed very different solutions to the same problem, jurists criticized mathematical astronomy only when it was used in astrology and did not criticize exact mathematical methods that differed from their own methods. Scientists, on the other hand, rarely spoke against the simplified methods of the religious scholars. Put differently, alternative methods of radically different provenance, one relying on religious tradition and the other on mathematical astronomy, were tolerated. The direction of the Qibla, however, was one major ex exception to this general rule. As I said, beyond the Hijaz, Syria, and Iraq, many of the mosques which were built in the early period of Islamic expansion were misaligned. With increased knowledge of mathematical astronomy, however, this flow was recognized, and while some of the misaligned mosques retained their orientation, others were rebuilt to face the correct direction of Mecca. This presented a serious problem, namely the problem of having to tear down mosques which were built on the authority of the companions of the Prophet, uh, and doing that because of the authority of mathematical astronomers. More generally, the question raised was whether mathematical knowledge should take precedence over religious authority in a matter where, admittedly, the, realm of, the realms of science and religion overlapped. I will start my lectures with a very brief overview of a debate that spanned several centuries, roughly from the 12th, at, in the manuscripts at least, and, and books that I examined, roughly from the 12th till, till the early 18th century, uh, on the problem of the direction of the Qibla of Fas. Fas is uh, one of the oldest cities in Morocco. I do not intend in this brief outline to treat the problem in any detail nor to address the general question of the relationship between science and religion, which is, is the subject of my third lecture. Rather, I would like to use the, the, use, the, the overview of the problem of the Qibla of Fas as a way of introducing the problematics that I would like to address in, the, in, in my lectures. According to the participants in the debate uh, in, over, over the direction of the Qibla uh, of, of Fas, a number of difficulties associated with finding the Qibla, the qibla in North Africa uh, were identified, not least because the religious scholars who authored the authoritative legal works used in North Africa did not mention ways of finding the direction of the Qibla using the stars and the rising and setting of the sun. A second difficulty, according to these sources, arises from the fact that there are drastic differences in the orientation of different mosques. Uh, it was in, in their face, as it were, uh, uh, such that one finds in the same city some mosques which are directed to the east and others to the south. Those who direct their mosques to the south rely on the hadith of the Prophet which says, quote, between the east and the west is a qibla, and take this to be a general hadith, while most religious scholars and certainly most astronomers consider this hadith to be relevant only to Medina, to, to the city of the Prophet, and to similar regions such as Syria. One important work on the subject, on this particular subject, was written by a person by the name of Tajuri, a 16th century re religious scholar and timekeeper. Tajuri's book includes a question soliciting the fatwas or religious rulings or opinions of scholars of Cairo and, uh, and, and Egypt in general about the mosques of Fas, which were directed towards the south, including the city's famous Qarawiyin uh, uh, Mosque the most important mosque school complex in Morocco. Tajuri maintains that these mosques are not directed towards what he calls the legal qibla, the qibla shari'a, which is the eastward direction of Mecca. In addition to the wrong interpretation of the hadith I just mentioned, those who defend the false qibla invoke the precedent or the practice of the early generations of Muslims who built the first mosques in, in, in Morocco 
in the presence and with the consent of religious scholars. To be sure, these early mosques were built before the rise of a, rise of a scientific culture in the Muslim world, but the religious authority of their builders was upheld even after the rise of science. Given the gravity of this, of, of this challenge, it's not surprising that Tajuri, the author of this particular book, wished to muster as much religious support for his position, and that's why he solicited the fatwas of, of religious scholars in, 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 uh, in Egypt. In addition to the support of the scholars of Egypt, Egypt, Tajuri also used the religious language to refer to the correct Qibla, calling it the Qibla of the companions and, and, and some such uh, uh, terms. Yet despite his veneer of religiosity, the real question was whether the Qibla was to, to be determined on the basis of religious precedence or mathematical astronomy. Tajuri was criticized and defended by several Fasi scholars who were concerned in this particular case, the most concerned in this particular case. But for the purposes of this very brief introduction, the most interesting defense of Tajuri's views was by late 17th century scholar by the name of Al-Arabi ibn Abd al-Salam al-Fasi. Uh, Al-Fasi refers to a distinction some people make between the jiha of the Qibla, which means the general direction of the Qibla, and the descent of the Qibla, which means the precise azimuth of the zenith of Mecca, the mathematical azimuth of, of the zenith of Mecca. People who make this distinction suggest that the only requirement of the law is that Muslims face the general direction of Mecca, of the Qibla, without requiring knowledge of its exact mathematical coordinates, which will, would involve, of course, knowledge of the science of geometry. And since knowledge of geometry is not a legal obligation, then no other legal obligation could be contingent on it. In response to this rather compromising view, Fasi insists that the meaning of, of jiha, of the general direction, and samt, the exact mathematical direction, are the same. And that geometry is not different from any other commonly used skill, sana'a, in his word, craft, such as construction and commerce. Because, and I'm quoting Tajuri here, each craft which involves precision and measurement partakes in geometry. Fasi distinguishes between two senses of the term jiha, direction, as an, as an objective in itself or as a means for finding the direction. The ultimate objective, he adds, is to find the mathematical coordinates of the direction of the Kaaba, whereas the second sense of the term refers to approximate approximations similar to the one indicated in the hadith of the Prophet. Furthermore, the, the exercise according to Tajuri, the exercise of independent legal reasoning, ishtihad, in matters related to the Qibla is only valid through the use of proofs which are suitable for finding this direction and not through guess and conjecture. End of quote from, uh, from Tajuri. Fasi then, from Fasi. Fasi then refers to a legal opinion attributed to Imam Malik, whose do doctrine is the official legal school of North Africa. Uh, everyone in North Africa, all Muslims in North Africa are Malikis, are for followers of Malik. Malik, uh, argues that if the, the orientation of a mosque is based on independent legal reasoning on ishtihad, then an error does not require rebuilding it. In response, Fasi maintains that this would be true if the ishtihad is based on proofs derived from astronomy or from the use of astronomical tables or the like, and that there is no credence in an ishtihad which is not based on such mathematical proofs. After noting the argument that holding all Muslims responsible on the basis of mathematical knowledge which only a few can maintain, is contrary to the spirit of Islamic law. After noting this argument, Fasi retorts that each, and I'm quoting here, each craft has its masters and nothing comes easy. Learning how to find the direction of the Qibla is similar to learning other sciences. In fact, it might even be easier than learning more elaborate texts, and it's attainable in a short period. In large cities, Fasi argues, it's illegal for someone who does not know how to find the direction of the Qibla to build a mosque, unless he is accompanied by the masters of the craft who know the proofs of the Qibla, Adillat al-Qibla, he calls it. It is only permissible to erect a mosque which is oriented towards the direction of Mecca, and someone who does not know the proofs of the Qibla should not exercise his ishtihad, even if he happens to be a jurist. Because the most a jurist can know, and I'm quoting Fasi here, the most a jurist can know in his capacity as a jurist is that it's obligatory to face the Qibla, and that it's obligatory for a non-mushtahid to imitate a mushtahid in this matter. In other words, to imitate a mathematical astronomer. That is, to imitate one who knows the suitable proofs for it. Fasi adds 
that the real mujtahids in the matter of the Qibla, using proofs suitable for it, are astronomers and not tourists, because the prerequisite of this ishtihad is knowledge derived from the sciences of mathematics, astronomy, timekeeping, the position of the planets, and the computation of directions. And all of these are outside the domain of the legal sciences. Furthermore, the ishtihad of astronomers in the matter of the Qibla is not similar to the ishtihad of tourists in applied law, because there is only one correct outcome for the ishtihad in the, in the case of the Qibla, whereas for jurists, each mujtahid, each any, any mujtahid who exercises his, his best, uh, who does his best, is correct in applied law. This is why in the matter of the Qibla, the astronomers are given precedence over jurists because each craft, again, has its masters, and the masters of the craft of finding the Qibla are the astronomers. The epistemological questions raised in these texts reflect widespread discussions that took place in many fields and over a very long period of time. Owing to the practical nature of the Qibla debate, the conceptual categories under discussion may at times seem vague. But these issues were articulated with much more precision in other theoretical debates. The significance of the Qibla debate is that precise epistemological discussions filtered down to the most sensitive matter of prayer and raised, in no uncertain terms, the question of intellectual authority within, as it were, the most sacred space in Islam. Quite clearly, this was not an academic debate relegated to the margins of Islamic culture. Mosques were actually torn down and, and, and rebuilt. But a debate which is constitutive of this culture, and as I will, I will argue, is one of its characteristic features. In the following lectures, I will examine the cultural significance of scientific knowledge and will try to situate the culture of science in relation to other cultural forces in Muslim societies. The, the primary question for the lectures is, what cultural forces provided the conditions of possibility of such epistemological debates? What was the context, context in which these debates emerged and were sustained? I will base my analysis on texts. Determining the significance of scientific texts and by, by extension of scientific knowledge is contingent on situating these texts within the tripart nexus of three systems of knowledge, religion, philosophy, and science. Any understanding of the cultural significance of Islamic scientific thought requires, by necessity, I think, an evaluation of the relationship between science and philosophy on one hand and science on, and religion on the other. I will address these relationships in the second and third lectures. And in the last lecture, I will describe what I think is a radical departure in modern times from the model that was carefully negoti negotiated in the classical period of Islam. Before I proceed with this examination, what I would like to do today is to try to identify, again, very, very briefly, what I think are some of the char characteristic features of the Arabo-Islamic scientific culture, and in the process, perhaps highlight some key questions in the historiography of science in Muslim societies. Beginnings. The history of Arabo-Islamic sciences is part of a larger, non-linear history that relates to earlier scientific traditions and that exerted scientific influences on later traditions. However, the Arabo-Islamic sciences are not reducible to what came before, nor is their significance simply on account of what happened after. The genealogical and teleological approaches to the history of Islamic science are legitimate subjects of inquiry, no doubt, but they are not the primary concern of my approach in, in, in the four lectures uh, that I will deliver. Rather, I'm more interested in examining the Islamic scientific culture as a historical occurrence whose singularity derives from the peculiar ways it relates to other cultural forces within Muslim society. To be sure, a historical account of the Islamic sciences may choose to ignore the fate of this scientific tradition and to focus on its life within its own historical context without losing much of its historical value. But no account of this tradition can hold without addressing the question of beginnings. That is, the conditions that under which an Arabo Islamic scientific culture emerged. However, determining the beginning, or beginnings probably is, is, is more accurate, is itself partly a function of the epistemological assumptions of the historian. Before the coming of Islam, and for, a, for over a century after its rise, Arabs had no science. Without exception, historians of Islamic science have rightly identified the translation movement, the bulk of which took place in the course of the ninth century as the most important factor in the emergence of an Islamic scientific culture. This translation movement of works from 
Indian sources, from Persian sources, but primarily from Greek. This translation movement provided the knowledge base of the emergent sciences. But while this explains part of the picture, and admittedly one of its most important parts, it does not provide a full explanation of the beginnings. To start with, what are the socio-political conditions and the cultural aptitudes that triggered interest in translation and science in the first place? Second, what were the cultural conditions that enabled a significant community of interest to know how to translate complex scientific texts to develop a technical the technical terminology needed for the transfer of scientific knowledge between two languages, to understand scientific texts once they are translated, and to constructively engage the knowledge derived from them. Seen in this light, translation is not a mechanical process, but is part of a complex historical process which is not reducible to the transfer of external knowledge. Rather, it involves forces intrinsic to the receiving culture. And finally, the lives of, sci of the sciences enabled by the translations are related to, but not identical with the life of the translation movement itself. The moment of translation, important as it is, is only an aspect of and one factor in the subsequent development of the Arabo-Islamic sciences, hence the title of this lecture, Beginnings and Beyond. The historical significance of scientific ideas and practices is shaped by multiple historical factors that an account of origins cannot possibly exhaust. In addition to origins, it's important to ask if and how individual scientific ideas acquired specific meanings in their new Islamic cultural context. What departures and innovations were occasioned by giving these ideas a new home? The focus here is not on precedents, despite the importance of the subject in the field of history of science. Rather, my focus on the, is on the way ideas were received in their own, own cultural context, how they enabled new practices and affected further, further developments in their own and other disciplines, and on the kinds of thinking and practices that were engendered by this cumulative process. Of course, uh, in the remaining time, I will have to make gen you know, very broad generalizations. Uh, on a subject which is vast, the, the, the scale of scientific production in, in Muslim societies is, is massive. Over s about eight centuries, there are thousands of, of, of scientists who are engaged in, in multiple scientific activities all over the Muslim world. There are tens, if not hundreds of thousands of, of, of scientific works that were produced, new disciplines, many, many new disciplines were invented, and so on and so forth. I think, however, it's possible to, to attempt a, a generalization, um, uh, although the vast majority of, of scientific mass manuscripts remain unstudied and in some cases even not even cataloged. Uh, but it's possible, given the amount of, of, of uh, studies that were produced in the last three decades or so, it's possible to, to attempt a, a generalization uh, of the kind that I'm attempting today. But I should say up front that this is a generalization, and, I'm, and you know, I look forward to, to your comments to, to refine the, the argument uh, 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 later on. Uh, for today's purposes, for the purposes of this lecture. The works that I will dra draw on most uh, are two interpretive essays written in the last decade which have attempted to address in systematic ways the social and historical roots of the translation movement in particular and the social factors that contributed to the rise and development of scientific thought in general. And allow me to, to elaborate a little bit because the, 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 these two studies are, are quite important uh, uh, regarding uh, today's subject. Uh, these are two books published, both published in 1998 by Professor Dimitri Gutas, who's here, and, uh, and uh, Professor George Saliba, my own advisor. Uh, the first is, uh, Arabic thought, uh, is Greek Thought, Arabic Culture, and the, the Saliba's book is Fikr Fikr al Almi al-Arabi, Arab, Arab, uh, Arabic Scientific Thought, Origins and, and, de and uh, Development. There are, to be sure, significant differences between these two studies and these two scholars. One main difference is that Saliba situates the main impetus for the rise of the Arabo-Islamic science in the Arabization of the administrative apparatus during the mid-8th century. Uh, that is, during the reign of, of the Umayyad Caliph, if you're familiar with the Caliphs and, and with the political history of, of Islam, the Umayyad Caliph Abdul Malik. Whereas Gutas argues that this impetus derived mainly from the imperial ideology adopted by the early Abbasid Caliphs, especially uh, one particular Caliph, Al-Mansur. Uh, and uh, which provided material support and hence created an atmosphere con conducive to the development of science. 
This material support according to Saliba catered to social needs, but derived mainly from the decision of the Umayyad ruler to dedicate huge resources for restructuring the state apparatus. Another significant difference is that Gutes identifies, uh, identifies interest in political astrology as an aspect of the ideological outlook of the Abbasids, whereas Saliba argues that astrology played a role in the development, but not rise of science. These differences aside, uh, to my mind, and Professor Gutas may disagree with me later, I think these two interpretations share a common approach to the question of beginnings. And the primary problematics addressed in both studies are quite similar as are the types of questions they ask. And these are the points I would like to draw to, 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 to underscore in, in, in uh, my lecture today. Above all, both scholars treat the translation movement and the scientific activity more broadly as a complex phenomena that does not lend itself to a single track and, st to single track and static explanations. Scientific activities, included tra including translation, received wide support from various classes, and thus cannot be explained as traditional accounts often su suggested in terms of the, of the interests of any particular group or the whim, whims and proclivities of any particular ruler. Both studies make a compelling case for situating the translation movement in the context of an emerging, emerg emerging scientific tradition in the growing Muslim urban centers that culminated in Baghdad. As such, translation is seen as an aspect of this emerging scientific culture and not its mechanical cause. And what's perhaps their main contribution, to my mind at least, these two studies recognize a major gap in earlier scholarship on Islamic science, namely the failure of this scholarship to identify a living scientific tradition within the Islamic cultural space that would explain the seemingly sudden appearance of a thriving scientific culture in the early decades of the ninth century. For translations to be understood and to have an impact, there must have existed a scientific culture, what I would call knowledge base, on which further knowledge could be grafted. Saliba argues that during the period of the Arabization of the administrative apparatus, a group of people became qualified and acquired foundational knowledge of the basics of various sciences. Gutas, on the other hand, argues the existence in the seventh and eighth centuries of what he calls international scholars. These were multilingual uh, scholars who knew Greek, Arabic, Syriac, Pahlavi. Uh, these were multilingual, scientifically competent scholars working in a region unified under Islamic rule and representative of a living scientific tradition before the period of translation. These international scholars practiced their profession in whatever environment offered the best support, thereby transmitting much scientific knowledge without translation. And when the Abbasid imperial ideology gave rise to a need and provided support for increased scientific activities, a critical mass of specialists came from the ranks of these international scholars. Whether it's through these international scholars, all the skilled professionals involved in the Arabization of the Umayyad administrative apparatus. By the beginning of the ninth century, scientific activity in the Muslim, in the Muslim world was, was ready to make a quantitative leap towards a more systematic and homogeneous scientific and philosophical inter enterprise. At this point in time, the practical social and political needs coupled with theoretical and scholarly needs, and this is, I would like to, to underscore this, this second point, scholarly needs, scientific needs, gave rise to and, and nurtured a systematic translation movement that had a great impact on the subsequent development of a scientific culture in the Muslim world. The two works I quoted here clearly illustrate that in addition to social and political factors, the conditions for the rise of a scientific culture must include an account of the knowledge base that made interest in the sciences and the subsequent act scientific activities possible. To the list of factors contributing to the formation of this, this prerequisite knowledge, knowledge base, uh, we should also mention the linguistic activities of early Muslim society. Preceding 9th century translations, the earliest scholarly productions among Muslims were of a linguistic nature. Of particular relevance to the later development of science was the extensive compilation efforts by Arabic philologists and lexicographers, the specialized lexicons that were produced in this period represent a large-scale attempt at collecting and classifying the knowledge of the Arabs, quote unquote. These attempts were not always scientific and they were eclipsed certainly by later more systematic achievements. Nonetheless, these encyclopedic efforts provided a linguistic foundation which fostered the development of the various intellectual disciplines. The foundational philological work done by the early lexicographers was the first step at organizing knowledge and in the production of a scientific culture. 
In addition to these foundational linguistic efforts, in certain cases, momentum for scientific research derived, for, derived from interest in language sciences. Combinatorial analysis, for example, was one such field. It developed not just in connection with algebraic research, but also linguistics. To compile an exhaustive Arabic lexicon, Al-Khalil bin Ahmad al-Farahidi, who died in 786 in the 8th century, before the, the, you know, the, the beginning of the main sort of translation movement started, um, and one of the earliest Arab lexicographers, Al-Khalil bin Ahmad enumerated for all the letters of the Arabic alphabet all the possible combinations of words with roots. Uh, Arabic is a Semitic language, as you know, and it's, it ha all words have a root of three to five letters. So he enumerated all the possible combinations of words with roots of three to five letters. Uh, Khalil bin Ahmad first restructured the words of the lexicon on formal grounds, thereby exhausting the domain of what he called the possible language. Defining real language as, quote, the voc vocally actualized part of the possible language, Al-Khalil then proceeded to eliminate those words that are not empirically verifiable in actual usage. By providing a theoretical solution to a practical linguistic problem, Al-Khalil rationalized the empirical practice of lexicography. More importantly, this linguistic activity provided an incentive for research in the, f in the field of comp combinatorial analysis. Now, one of the most commonly repeated assertions in general histories of science is that the rational sciences in Islam were marginalized because of the lack of, institutions, of institutional support. The primary evidence for this marginalization thesis is adduced from the alleged exclusion of the rational sciences from the curricula of formal institutions of learning. In his classic work on the rise of colleges, George Makhdisi contends that the quintessential institutions of learning in Muslim societies, the madrasa, and its antecedent and cognate institutions were exclusively devoted to the study of the legal sciences and other ancillary religious and philological disciplines and had no room uh, for the rational sciences. There is a long debate that I will have to skip in the interest of time. But one significant recent, relatively recent significant exception to the relative consensus among scholars of Islamic education on the marginality of the sciences in the, in the, is the contribution of a scholar by the name of Sonia Brentis. Brentis surveys the social and cultural spaces for the practice of the rational science in Muslim societies. Using accounts and biographical dictionaries, she argues that like the religious sciences, education in, in the exact sciences was a stable aspect of education in Muslim societies. Furthermore, this education took place within recognizable networks whose structures parallel those of the religious sciences. This obs observation is born by the information culled from the biographical dictionaries and from the abundant use in these sources of parallel discourses to descri describe education in the rational as well as traditional sciences. In these discourses on education and knowledge, the rational sciences are always presented and treated with respect and are often presented in alliance with the religious sciences. In fact, the evidence for the presence of, of, of the rational sciences as a constitutive element in the educational landscape of classical Muslim societies, in my view, is simply overwhelming. Above all, the testimony for this constant presence comes from the actual combination of religious and scientific scholarship in the persons of numerous scholars, uh, especially after the 12th century. In different regions and periods, countless scholars produced advanced scholarship in such fields, uh, fields as hadith, the traditions of the Prophet Muhammad, and medicine, Quranic exegesis and astronomy, uh, law and philosophy, not to mention theology, grammar, logic, and many more. Scholars often alternated teaching religious and scientific disciplines in, in the same places. Moreover, the rational sciences were always present in the many classifications of science uh, that proliferated in Islamic scholarship. Further evidence for the respectability of the rational sciences is the abundant side-by-side -side appearance in biographical dictionaries of scholars of the rational and religious sciences. Moreover, in countless entries in biographical di dictionaries which are dedicated to such disciplines as Islamic law, the study of hadith, or other religious disciplines, the command by individual scholars of the rational sciences is celebrated as a positive trait without any qualification. A significant number of, uh, of entries also mention that these their subjects studied or taught one or more of the secular sciences and wrote books in these fields. Significantly similar expressions and terms are used to praise a scholar's knowledge in rational as well as religious sciences. 
The examples cited so far are from biographical dictionaries dedicated to religious scholarship. Uh, equally important is the emergence of a specialized kind of biographical dictionaries dedicated to physicians or practitioners of the rational sciences as with other kinds of biographical dictionaries, these specialized biographies reflect the community's awareness, first of all, of its own professional and intellectual identity. Moreover, these works serve as attempts by a community to legitimize its own knowledge and to present it as a worthy achievement of the larger Muslim community, thereby situating a particular professional practice within the mainstream of Islamic culture. Through these and other means, the pursuit of science was conceptualized as an act that has social and epistemological value in its own right. In addition to these modes of sanctioning science, other structures were instituted to, prom to, instituted to promote and support scientific activity. As, as I already noted, science was taught in a variety of venues, ranging from private homes to endowed and, and structured settings. Similarly, science was practiced in various locales, ranging from private homes, again, to formal institutions. Medicine, for example, uh, was taught privately in the homes of individual phys physicians, but it was also taught systematically in endowed hospitals. And as of the 12th uh, or 13th centuries, it was also taught in endowed schools that were established exclusively for the teaching of, of, of uh, medicine. Uh, I could go on and on about medicine and uh, the institutions for teaching medicine. The teaching of, of mathematics and astronomy uh, also uh, uh, was, was partly integrated into the curricula of religious schools through the discipline of al-fara'id, which means uh, inheritance algebra. Inheritance laws are a bit complex uh, in, in, in Islam, and uh, solving you know, an, an inheritance problems could be a challenge. And you really need to know algebra, second degree equations at least. Uh, and uh, there is a f discipline which was developed, which was called fara'id, which is inheritance algebra, and that was taught in, in many religious settings. Uh, another discipline, timekeeping, Alm al the science of timekeeping, Miqat, which dealt with, uh, with timekeeping and cal calendar computation, visibility of moon, and so on, was also taught in, in, uh, in religious settings. And we ha while we have some evidence for the teaching of theoretical astronomy after the 13th century in religious schools, we are much more informed about the institutional framework for the practice of the science of astronomy. Uh, one such institution was the observatory. And I will skip this part. There were a number of observatories throughout. Of course, the thing about observatories is that you know, they're not the main institutions for, for the practice or teaching of, of, of science, but they endow the practice with prestige. Uh, and uh, we, you know, it's one way of getting money and, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but Islamic history is punctuated with a, with a number of significant, of, of very important uh, observatories, starting with the beginning again of the translation movement. Al Ma'moon, uh, in the beginning, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the beginning of the, of the, in the first quarter of the, of the ninth century, uh, established, uh, sort of, uh, assembled a, a group to do observations first in Baghdad, and then when these observations didn't work, he sent them to Syria to do, to conduct another set of observations and compare them and so on and so forth. And that practice continued throughout. There are, there are a series of, of, uh, of observatories that were formed. Some of the most important uh, work in, in theoretical astronomy was actually produced by people who worked in such observatories. One particular observatory is Maragha, 13th century Maragha, lasted for about, uh, very active for about 30 years and continued for, uh, for more than half a century. And uh, some of the most important work in, in theoretical astronomy was produced in it. So this is one, one set of institutions. Although not all of, uh, 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 and the thing about, about this institution is, is that uh, um, there are institutional features that are very uh, visible in, 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 uh, in these observatories. Um, now, a different model for the social sanctioning of astronomy and the related integration of astronomical institutions within society is the emergence of, of the office, as I said, of the timekeeper in many mosques uh, all over the Muslim world. Although timekeeping activities are not identical with the activities conducted at observatories, they did provide stable facilities and resources for use by individual astronomers. From a pure scientific point of view, there are cases when the achievements of timekeepers were superior to those of observatory astronomers, if, you, if I may use the term. The best example, of course, is the celebrated, but he's not the only one. There are many, many others uh, aside from him. The best example is the celebrated 14th century astronomer, Damascene astronomer, Ibn Shatir, 
who occupied the position of a timekeeper at the Umayyad Mosque in, in Damascus. Uh, Ibn Shatir conducted extensive observations, designed and constructed new uh, instruments, and produced the most advanced and successful contributions of astronomy, uh, uh, Islamic astronomy in the field of planetary theory. So this is another uh, setting, and one could go on uh, and on on, on on the subject. Now, the practice of science, therefore, did not occur in a vacuum. And while the modes of supporting this practice changed over time and varied with discipline, there can be no doubt that right from the beginning, the sciences were an enduring feature of the intellectual landscape of Muslim societies. Beginnings were also instrumental in shaping the practice of science in ways that had lasting effects on its later development. In the course of the lectures, I will repeatedly remind you of the predominance of the Greek scientific tradition and of its vital influence on the development of Arabo-Islamic sciences. However, despite the paramount importance of the Greek traditions, Arabic sciences did more than simply preserve the Greek scientific legacy and pass it to its European heirs. In fact, evidence from the earliest extant scientific sources indicates that the translation movement was concurrent with, rather than a prerequisite for, scientific research in the Islamic world. Simultaneous research and translation took place in more than one field. And in more than one case, even when some of the scientific texts were being translated, they were also reformulated and transformed. In attempting to, ex to explain this phenomena, it's worth keeping in mind that the absorption of the Greek, Persian, and Indian scientific legacies into the Islamic culture took place in the context of a Islam dominant Islamic polity. To put it differently, Muslims were not in a position of political subordination, which probably explains the ease with which they were willing to borrow from other cultures. To my mind, however, more important than this possible sense of security is the multiplicity of the scientific legacies that informed Islamic science. In a classic and much quoted work on the history of Arabic astronomy published in 1911, Carlo Nalino downplays the Persian and Indian influences and suggests that the scientificity, if, if I may use this word, of Arabic science is largely due to its reliance on the Greek sciences. However, without denying the disproportionate weight of the Greek tradition, I would argue that the other two legacies were extremely important in two respects. First, because they explain some of the earliest research in, the, in, in fields such as algebra, uh, which were con concurrent with and not subsequent to the beginnings of the translation of the Greek mathematical works. Otto Neugebauer, in a, in a famous uh, historian of science, in a passing remark in his uh, Exact Sciences in Antiquity, uh, suggests that you know, this appearance of, you know, right at the beginning of the translation movement, the appearance of a new science, a completely new science perhaps, has uh, Babylonian or origins. But the second and more important uh, point uh, which makes these other traditions, uh, the Greek, and the Indian and, and, and Persian traditions important, is because of the availability of multiple scientific traditions to choose from. The availability, av availability of multiple traditions to choose from allowed an eclectic and discriminating approach to each of the inherited scientific legacies. The early dynamics of translation and original composition suggest that the small amount of non-Greek translations had the effect of hybridizing knowledge which in turn had a lasting impact on the attitude towards the dominant Greek sciences. Again, I don't have time to get into this in great detail. Algebra is a case in point, but more important probably than algebra. Algebra was, was it's a new science, what, which was invented by Khawarizmi. Of course, there were people who performed algebraic operations way before, uh, before the rise of Islam and, and, and many earlier traditions. But algebra as a science, which has its new title, which has its subject matter, which is algebraic equations, as opposed to simply performing an, oper an algebraic operation without calling it a science, uh, which has its own terminology, and so on and so forth, which has its methods, which is systematic and meant to be exhaustive. All of this happened uh, in, with the invention of Kitab al-Jabr wal-Muqabala, after, after which the, the, the science is named by al-Khwarizmi, again in the beginning of the ninth century. Now, more important than algebra, uh, the, the uh, uh, the, uh, already in the second half of the 9th century, Qusta ibn Luqa, one of the translators, had translated the first seven books of the Arithmetica of Diophantes into Arabic. Significantly, however, the Arabic translation was, was given the title The Art of Algebra. Uh, the translator's use of the language and conception of the new field of algebra reoriented the Arithmetica of Diophantes and provided instead an algebraic interpretation of this arithmetic. 
and which later people recognized and they, they retranslated uh, the arithmetics so that it's faithful to the original. But you could see how the invention of a new tradition actually transformed a work of translation as it's being translated. In this particular instance, the translation from Greek into Arabic was both motivated and conditioned by the earlier original research in Arabic algebra. This illustrates the transformative effects of the cross-application of multiple scientific disciplines and how old sciences can be restructured and new, new sciences constructed by applying the tools of one discipline to another. And this became a favorite sort of uh, uh, motif for, throughout the, the, the Islamic sciences. Take one science and apply it on another and see what happens. And invariably, there are new sciences which were invented uh, this way. The first in, in mathematics, first was the application of, uh, of uh, algebra on, on arithmetics. Then the, the arithmetization of, of algebra itself, a systematic attempt to arithmetize algebra. To, and, and, uh, and, and later on, uh, again, uh, applied geometry to algebra. And you know, geometric algebra was, was, was uh, the, the discipline of geometric algebra was, uh, was invented. More than any other scholar, Rushdi Rashid has done tremendous work, uh, a historian of, of uh, Arabic uh, mathematics, has done tremendous work to, to outline uh, these, these developments. A similar thing can be traced in astronomy. Um, again, multiple disciplines. The earliest works that were translated in astronomy were uh, Persian and, uh, and, and Indian. The earliest extant work, uh, which was also composed by al-Khawarizmi, original work, composed by al-Khawarizmi, uh, has many Indian uh, parameters in it. And also, it uses uh, parameters from uh, Ptolemy's handy tables and so on and so forth. So the earliest works that we have uh, in, in, uh, in uh, astronomy as well uh, have uh, similar features. A similar thing can be traced in medicine. Uh, the uh, first systematic uh, comprehensive work was composed by uh, uh, Ali ibn Sahil Rabban al-Tabari in the mid-9th century, and it's uh, called Firdaus al-Hikmah, the Paradise of Wisdom. Uh, and uh, again, it's a combination of Indian medicine and, uh, and uh, Greek medicine. It's very eclectic. And, and so on and so forth. Now, the, the point that I'm trying to make, I can't, I mean, the examples are endless. Uh, in almost every single case, one could see uh, as a scientific discipline, one can find examples. The point I'm, I'm trying to make is that the main role of Indian medicine was not to, or science, uh, was not to define the contours of the Arabic medical tradition or the Arabic scientific tradition, but to set the tone for some of its initial interests and curiosities. Although the Greek scientific legacy was the dominant one, a mere awareness of more than one available tradition encouraged a critical and selective approach that pervades all fields of Arabic science. A critical awareness of the possibility of multiple interpretations and approaches to various scientific disciplines characterized the practice of science throughout the ninth and century and beyond. This in turn result resulted in three related trends. First, a thorough mathematization examination of the details of various disciplines, to sort of perfect the details of the disciplines. In astronomy, for example, examine all the parameters and observations of Ptolemy and see if you could refine them, make them better, and so on. Uh, an attempt, the second is an attempt to systematize and generalize these disciplines. And finally, the production of exhaustive syntheses of individual disciplines as well as several related ones. Uh, again, there are numerous cases that I could, uh, that I could, uh, I, I hope someone will ask me questions about the subject. I'll be glad to come back to it. Uh, I, I have to move on, but we can trace this in, in all the fields, in mathematics, in, 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 uh, in astronomy, in medicine, and in, in, um, in many others, in optics and, and so on. Now, the, the second, the, the, an another point that I would like to, to highlight uh, is the invention of new sciences. One of the distinctive results of the reorganization and the cross-application of different sciences to each other was the invention of new sciences. As I already noted, this was already the case with the discipline of algebra, which was conceived as a new science with its distinct subject matter, technical terminology, method, and title. In addition to its novelty, the significance of al-Khawarizm's kitab al-Jabr wal-Muqabala, Khawarizm's algebra, is in the research it triggered when applied to other branches of mathematics. Starting with al-Khawarizmi and on to al-Khayyam, the famous uh, poet al-Khayyam and mathematician, and Tusi, several mathemat mathematicians were fully aware of the utility of the cross-fertilization of mathematical disciplines 
and the novelty of this sort of research. So they did, this is an exercise which they engaged in deliberately and consciously. It's not, you know, by accident. They deliberately applied one discipline on, uh, to another discipline to see what, what the outcome would, would be. They concocted, um, they concocted unfamiliar titles for their books, coined technical terminology unique to their disciplines, organized their works and decided the different ways, invented original mathematical algorithms to solve the problems of their disciplines. Above all, they conceived of totally new subjects and mathematical concepts. Such innovations were made possible by the deliberate and systematic application. In, in the case of uh, mathematics, uh, the application of algebra, arithmetic, and geometry, applying them to each other. Uh, trigonometry is, a, is, a, is another hybrid discipline. The science of weights is, is another discipline that was invented conceptual and conceptualized as a new science with its rules and principles and so on. Pharmacology, there are numerous uh, you know, examples that one could point out in pharmacology, and, and again, the, the list goes on. Another point that I would like, another sort of characteristic of, 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 the, of the practice of science is uh, what I would call the epistemological rehabilitation of practical knowledge. The invention of numerous new scientific disciplines did not result solely from the cross-fertilization of different theoretical sciences, but owes much to the attitude towards practical skills and knowledge that derives from them. Uh, with the exception of some die-hard Hellenists, the attitude in Muslim societies towards practical crafts and knowledge was fundamentally different from the Greek one. In a culture that ascribes the highest value to the legal religious sciences, which are quintessentially practical. Uh, there was little room for a negative attitude towards practical sciences of any sort. Let, uh, right from the very beginning, utilitarian consideration provided incentives for the pursuit of science. As mentioned earlier, practical needs included such subjects as land surveying, inheritance, algebra, irrigation technologies, calendar computation, and timekeeping, in addition to mass medicine and related sciences. The list of practical disciplines that were officially recognized as sciences is long, and it provides evidence for a different attitude towards practical knowledge. These disciplines had distinct and often completely new titles. Moreover, scientists did not shun away from composing numerous books on these subjects, and they often explicitly defended the epistemological value of their knowledge. And finally, almost invariably, the classification of sciences genre, which proliferated in Muslim societies, listed these practical disciplines as full-fledged sciences. Let me give a couple of examples, because I think this is an important point. I've already referred to the science of mechanic, mechanical devices. Um, well, I referred to it in my written manuscript. I, I skipped it in, in, uh, in, in, the, in the part that I read. Uh, the science of mechanical devices, which of course drew on a rich Greek tradition, what is noteworthy in the Arabic tradition is the unapologetic promotion of this craft to the level of science and its subsequent development into what for all practical purposes looks like mechanical engineering. Uh, and I'll explain what I mean. Early description of mechanical devices were strictly schematic. Diagrams were used to illustrate the theory underlying a device and not to provide information on its construction or relative dimensions or, or, or what have you. The first book which can be considered the mechanical engineering handbook was Kitab fi Ma'rifat al al Handasiya, a book on uh, knowing the uh, uh, geometrical, Hayal means tricks, but it means mechanical tricks, uh, by Al Jazari around 1200. In addition to the schematic illustration of how machines work, the book gives detailed instruction on the dimensions of their various parts, the materials to be used, and their treatment, how they should be treated, for example, lamination to prevent trapping and so on. I mean, the sort of stuff that I know from my previous career. Casting techniques and information on finishing, calibration, and priming procedures. In short, the book provides all the information needed to manufacture a machine, not only to understand the way it works. And this was considered science. I, I, I have another example which I like and I would like to share with you in, in the field of agronomy. Agronomy and the agricultural sciences uh, uh, were cultivated with great success in Andalus in, in Spain. The numerous works written in this field underscore a conscious em emphasis by scientists on, on the importance of relying on practical knowledge in deriving the principles, the called mabadi, of the science of agronomy. 
those who rely solely on pure philosophic on the on, on the pure philosophical tradition are pejoratively referred to as imitators muqallidun which is a term used in, in the religious sciences as well uh, usually in a negative way because they do not grant their assertion on knowledge derived from the from practice from tajrib in numerous instances where the flaws of the philosophical agricultural tradition are pointed out, these sources insist that the sound foundations of the science of agriculture ought to combine theoretical philosophical knowledge with knowledge that derives from, from manual work and with experimentation which provides the definitive proof, Burhan, over which there could be no doubt. In one source, the ideal specialist in the science of agriculture, specialists in the science of agriculture are called Hukama al-Fallahin, which means the peasant philosophers or the philosopher peasants, I don't know which way. Uh, which is, you know, quite interesting, I think. Again, uh, you know, there are similar trends in the various mathematical disciplines and medicine and so on and so forth. These and many other examples illustrate the tendency to correlate theoretical and practical knowledge and to treat the crafts as sciences, thereby establishing a stable unity between theory and practice. One of the effects of this promotion of practical knowledge was also uh, uh, a higher degree of professionalization of science as a whole, with the increasing emphasis on its alliance with practical disciplines. But in my view, one of the most important outcomes of this shift was the dramatic expansion of the consumer base of scientific knowledge. Put differently, the tacit knowledge needed to understand the sciences was now shared by significantly larger sectors of the intellectual elite of, of Muslim society. The sciences were now dealing with problems that punctured every aspect of the daily lives of Muslims. We have already seen the example of the Qibla, how the discussion was conducted at various levels, thereby allowing a much larger group of people to take part in it. Another illustration of this trend is the seemingly random use of old and as well as new mathematical methods in the solution of astronomical problems. Hence, the same author may use an, an archaic method in one place and an advanced method in, in another. Menelaus, uh, for example, theorem in one case and the sign theorem in another, which is more advanced. Uh, Beiruni, for example, uses both the old cumbersome Menelaus theorem as well as the new elegant sign rule in, in several solutions of the problem of the direction of the Qibla. This simultaneous use of different mathematical procedures can neither be attributed to the slow dissemination of, dissemination of scientific knowledge nor to the limited circulation of this knowledge. There is ample evidence for a high level of mobility and, and of efficient and speedy communication among scientists working in various regions of the Muslim world. Bayrouni himself did, did not travel to Baghdad, but he apparently corresponded with and was fully aware of scientific developments there and elsewhere. Contrary to what it may first suggest, the use of different methods is likely a result of the increasing diffusion of scientific knowledge among large segments of, edu of the educated elite. Within the broad ranks of these elites, full-time scientists are expected to keep up with the latest research in their fields, while scholars with partial interest in science would be familiar only with the older theories and methods. The use of a variety of mathematical methods is thus an indication of, a degree to, of the degree to which scientific culture had filtered in, into society and the extent to which it became available to the average member of the educated class. This brings me to the last point of today's lecture. Everything we discussed today demonstrates that the culture of science struck deep roots in classical Muslim societies. Various developments contributed to the transformation of science from peripheral, peripheral elitist activity, as it has been in earlier cultures, to an institutionalized activity with an unprecedented scale of social support and, and, and participation. And no earlier culture supported science to the extent that it was supported. Of course, it's not similar to what it's, what it, it's, it's different from what happened with the rise of the new science, with the scientific revolution. But prior to the rise of Islam, no other culture supported science to the same extent and at the same scale. One aspect of the centrality of scientific culture is the existence of actual communities of scientists, which, as we have seen, had a sense of collective professional identity. But more important than this collective sense of identity is that in their respective fields of specialization, these communities shared codes of practice, canons of study, and research agendas and projects, both empirical and theoretical. The reason I underscore, underscore this point is because so much earlier work on the history of Islamic science asserts that most of the original discoveries and contributions of Islamic science were isolated occurrences, or as the term is sometimes used, happy guesses. 
that had no impact on their Islamic environment and were only appreciated in, in Latin Europe. I could give you an example later on if you, if you wish. In the last few decades, the foundation, foundational research of all historians of Islamic science has done much to, under, to undermine this thesis. But it continue, continues to inform the discussions of general historians of science, such as, for example, Toby Huff, uh, Edward Grant, and the little reference that he makes in, in his otherwise brilliant work, but in the little reference that he makes to Islam, he makes this point. If you look at the chapter on Islam in Lindbergh's and in in, you know, in many of the, the David Lindbergh's works, this is the point is made over and over and over again, despite the work of histori historians of Islamic science. Recent research has provided compelling evidence for the continuity and coherence of the Arabic scientific tradition. We've already referred to the collaborative observational activities starting in the ninth century and continuing un unabated for many centuries to come. Other examples can be found in the tradition of reforming Ptolemaic astronomy that started in the 11th century and continued until at least the 16th and which spanned most of the Islamic world. A definite and continuous research agenda which I will talk about in greater length the next time, guided the research of all the major theoretical astronomers who read and commented on each other, and in some cases even assembled together to conduct joint research. Similarly, research on the disciplines of Arabic mathematics has, has revealed that for each instance of seemingly isolated scientific breakthrough, there are in fact precedents and successors, as well as a community of interest scholars and intellectuals. More than any other scholar, Rushdi Rashid has systematically explored the, the various mathematical scientists, uh, uh, sciences and established the continuities in each and every one of these disciplines. In one example, Rashid illustrates how Khayyam's monumental contribution to the theory of algebraic equations were not isolated as general surveys of history of mathematics often assert. Rashid shows, shows how Khayyam's work builds on the earlier tradition of algebraic research and, and, and a continuous tradition and not just one or two precedent, but a continuous tradition, and constitutes only the beginning of a long and continuous tradition that was further transformed a half century later by Sharaf al-Din Tusi. In its analytical approach, the work of Tusi on equations marks yet another beginning of the discipline of algebraic geometry, the study of curves by means of equations. The point that I'm trying to make is there are continuities, but also these continuities lead to new beginnings, as it were. Communities of scholars that include not only first-class mathematicians, but also commentators of, of lesser reputation, as well as scholars working in other fields, contributed to the creation and diffusion of a multitude of mathematical traditions. For every celebrated scientist known to have conducted rigorous research in any field of science, there are many more practitioners who provided the context without which such, adv such uh, uh, advances would have been impossible. Moreover, we have records of simultaneous discoveries or inventions of mathematical theorems by more than one scholar. For example, Bayruni, the 11th century Bayruni, tells us that the general theorem of science, known as, known as the rule of four quantities, was discovered simultaneously and independently by three astronomers from Khwarizm, from Baghdad, and Rai. These are Abu Nasr uh, ibn, ibn Iraq, Abu Wafa al Buzjani, and Al Khujandi. Aside from the claim of precedence, which reflects an active competitiveness among scientists, which is itself interesting in its own right, uh, this account also suggests that a discovery becomes inevitable on account of the, of the research needs of a particular science and the accumulated knowledge available to fulfill these needs. Uh, in all the sciences, there always existed communities of scientists that provided temporal and spatial continuity for the culture of science communities that practiced what Thomas Kuhn would call normal science. These normalized practices provided the social as well as, as, well as intellectual context for the exceptional moments of creativity in the history of Islamic science. I've tested your patience, so I better conclude. I'm doing well, right? Okay. In today's lecture, I focused on the context of the emergence and to some extent the development of an Arabo-Islamic scientific culture. I also tried to identify some common patterns that characterize the practice of science and the modes of scientific thinking. I do recognize, however, that historical continuity is not necessarily the same as epistemological continuity and that there is no necessary connection between the historical formation of a science and its theoretical and epistemological structure. So important as contexts are, I think we need, I at least do recognize that contexts are patched together and can only be so. Moreover, 
contexts are multiple and at times conflicting. So in the following two lectures, although I will not dispense with context, I will not be confined to it, and will rather try to focus on the complexities of texts, their internal logic, and their relation to various intellectual traditions. In doing so, I hope to describe, and to some extent, perhaps even explain, the changes in the worldviews connected and resulting from these historical practices of science. On the negative side of things, I will neither give an account of Islamic science as the precursor of European science, though in many respects it was, nor as the scientific culture that failed to produce the scientific revolution, a theme which seems to be a staple of many brilliant accounts of the rise of the new sciences. Uh, brilliant there is in every regard except when it comes to Islamic science. Um, suffice it to say that the rise of the new European science is a thing to be explained and cannot be a principle of explanation of something that happened before it. In fact, a better understanding of the Islamic sciences might contribute to such explanations, but that is beyond the scope of, of my lectures. Thank you. I appreciate your uh, numerous examples of how um, Muslim scholars were prepared to, to engage and incorporate uh, what we call natural science into their work. I wondered if you could um, give me a schematic as to how what you were calling, I think, the rational sciences and the religious sciences were related in that I wonder if, if um, theology was elevated to the status of a science like the sciences that existed or whether um, science was um, incorporated and became a form of theology? Yes. Or whether the, the two were simply kept distinctly different because I'm familiar with this dialogue uh, within Christianity and I see these three dynamics as possibilities. Well, there are several questions in your question and the reason I didn't address any, they're extremely important. The reason I didn't address them is that this, these are the topics of the next, um, the next two lectures. I'll be back. One is on <laughs> philosophy and science and specifically natural philosophy or natural knowledge or natural science, or, and I'll talk about these things next time. And the other is about religion and science. So, uh, you know, I, <laughs> I don't wanna, you know, I don't, you know, I would like people to come back. And <laughs> Thank you for your lecture and for your work. I have a specific question and then maybe a larger <clears throat> question which you may also get to in a later lecture. Um, you said that no other culture had paid as much attention to science in certain specific ways, maybe the institutionalization and so on. And, um, the scale, the scale. Sca on that scale. Yeah. Um, and I wonder if you would just comment on Joseph Needham's work of Chinese civilization and science and so on in, in relation to um, Islamic science, because he certainly makes a case uh, in, in certain ways for the presence of science in Chinese culture. So that's a specific question. And the, the other one is, um, many years ago in a seminar at NYU that I was at, Franz Rosenthal, a professor from Yale, um, came to this seminar and said, um, <clears throat> the closing of the doors, so to speak, um, in Islam, uh, someone asked him what he thought as to why that happened later um, in Islamic history. And his answer was quite intriguing, and he said, um, almost like the present day, he said, uh, because they drowned in the amount of knowledge that they had, and they were not able necessarily to find clarity forward. It's almost like the information of our own particular age. Anyway, it was a very insightful comment by a wonderful historian of, of Islam, and so that's the larger question if you want to just muse on that one yeah. too. Let me start with the second one. Uh, we all owe a lot to Professor Rosenthal's work. Uh, I think in particular what, you know, he, what he might be referring to is the proliferation of many new disciplines. He, he might, I'm not sure, but that's probably uh, one of the things that he had in mind, the proliferation of many new disciplines. You see, the genre of classification, classifying the sciences 
uh, was a very common genre. There are many, many, many classifications. And there are some scholars who looked at this genre and they said, and they were confused. Uh, they didn't know what to make of it because each each uh, you know scholar had their own classification and what seems at times as their own different you know their own principles of organizing knowledge and so on and so forth uh, and some scholars have were confused in, in looking at this tradition uh, they you know and, and as one particular scholar said you know Muslims received this very neat uh, Greek classification system and they started tagging on. Uh, their own disciplines to it, and it became all confused and, and useless, and so on and so forth, and, and, and so on. So, the, uh, of course, Professor Rosenthal didn't say that, but uh, I think, and I will be talking about that in, in the next lecture, I think there is a, there is a problematic uh, which is beneath all these classifications. There are issues which, are be, which people are thinking of. I mean, they're thinking of about the relationship between various traditions, and this is a, this is a, a shared sort of problematic. And one could trace trends in, these, uh, in, in the development of, of, of the field of, of the classification of the sciences. Of course, it keeps on changing because there are new sciences which are being added. So you have to fit them in, and you have to rethink the relationship between them. Uh, you have to rethink the relationship between the, the specific disciplines, but also the relationship between systems of knowing. And this is specifically what I'll be talking about next time. And there isn't one school, there are several schools. Um, but, you know, the, 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 this, is, this is part of the problematic that I'll be addressing next time. So hopefully I will address that point to some extent next time. As to, you know, competing with China, <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe China is an equal amount. <laughs> I'm happy, you know, either way. <laughs> but the scale is, is quite large, certainly. At least in comparison to the, to the traditions that, that informed the Islamic sciences, the scale is much larger. I appreciated your presentation very much. Uh, in regard to the translation or the transmission of Aristotle to the West, was there a, um, what should we say, common interest or a common concern for monotheism, which was present in Aristotle and also in Islam, which made it possible for the Muslims to adopt Aristotle as a philosopher of their own? Uh, Dimitri, would you like to answer that? <laughs> uh, well, uh, Aristotle was, the, the first sort of full-fledged philosopher in the Islamic tradition was a person by the name of Al-Kindi. And uh, right from the beginning, Al-Kindi's Al -Kindi's reading of, uh, I mean, it wasn't a perfect reading of Aristotle. He is not the one who commanded Aristotle most, more than, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a gradual process. But already in the work of, of, of Al-Kindi, uh, you find that philosophy is, if not subjugated to religion, is harmonized with religion. So Kindi has, you know, in the agenda of Al-Kindi, and therefore in his reading of Aristotle, he wants to use Arist Aristotelianism to, to the extent that it's possible, of course. It's not always possible to do that, uh, as a way to, in some cases, to reinforce religious beliefs and, and, and traditions. Of course, this falls uh, outside my, my area of interest. but. We see in the earliest sort of works on, and, and you know, on, on, on philosophical philosophical works in the Islamic philosophical tradition, which is of course primarily Aristotelian, we see attempts to uh, to bring in religious concerns and to to deal with them. Of course, when we move forward to someone like Farabi, Farabi is uh, is truer to the Aristotelian tradition and less willing to compromise the tradition in the interest of religion. But then again, we have Ibn Sina, who's m probably more systematic and Aristotelian than Aristotle himself, if I may say so again. Uh, but, uh, but also Ibn Sina deals with questions which Aristotle didn't deal with. I mean, he, he discusses issues of uh, existence and, and issues which intersect with, with religion. Uh, and, you know, he's, he's the, he has a, a whole theory about uh, uh, necessary existence and so on and so forth, which had its religious uh, utility, if you will. Uh, uh, now, whether Aristotle lends himself to 
a monotheistic interpretation. I'm not an expert on Aristotle. Some people would argue, yes, that he does. Uh, he certainly was used, um, you know, he was sort of interpreted uh, in Christian theology uh, in ways, you know, which made him useful for, for uh, Christian theological arguments. And there are similar, there are some similar patterns in the Islamic tradition, and multiple and very diverse and, and different. I'm sorry, if my answer is not clear, it's, it's because it's not exactly my subject. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. I have one question. Um, unfortunately, during, like some of the uh, classical reformist authors in the 19th century blamed Ot like Ottoman Empire for the decline in science in uh, Islam, like Islamic world. And I know for a fact that there have been some clash as between religion and Islam. Yeah, sorry? There have been some clash between religion, and, like uh, Islam and science and Ottoman Empire. Because uh, for certain research, for example, the permission has to be taken from the caliph and the fatwa, and it wasn't given. Was, it, was this clash uh, just specific to Ottoman Empire, or did it happen in uh, other dynasties prior to Ottoman Empire? Was there a clash between religion, Islam, and science? Well, I, I don't know the exact example that you're referring to, the clash in the Ottoman, uh, but the, the, irrespective of what that example may be, I mean, you know, uh, Islamic history is more than 14 centuries now. So there are instances, of yeah. course, of clashes, and uh, but there are instances of harmony, uh, which doesn't mean that, you know, we leave it at that. I will be arguing in the lec next lectures that there are main sort of trends, and I will try to, you know, try to explain these trends and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, you can always find instances of this or that anywhere, but again, you know, there are larger trends which are reflected in writings and practices and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, of course, there were in instances, some instances of clash, and uh, you know, one of the which I had in my written uh, manuscript, but I had to skip. Uh, one of the most influential works in, 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 um, on, on the uh, history of, uh, on the relationship, relationship between science and religion was composed by Goldsier more than a century ago. Uh, uh, it's called The Attitude of uh, Orthodox Islam Towards the uh, Ancient Sciences. Uh, the, the, the old, uh, there is something which is dropped out of the, I forgot, the, but anyway. Something is allowed. And he, uh, Goldsier marshals all the evidence for conflict and contradiction. Uh, again, Professor Gutas has a section in his book, uh, that, uh, the book that, that I mentioned, where he mm, sort of takes on Goldsier's argument very systematically. Um, I mean, it's still, Goldsier's argument still informs someone like Toby Huff, who knows nothing about the history of science in any tradition. You know, Toby Huff wrote this book about why the science, the scientific revolution happened in. Uh, in uh, Europe and not in China or in Islam. And I think he doesn't know anything about any of the three traditions. Uh, but uh, he, his main source is, is Goldsier. And, you know, it's, uh, everything he knows about Islamic science is practically from this one article by Goldsier. It remains a very influential article. Uh, and there are people who assert that there is a conflict and contradiction or whatever. I will be speaking to that in the next two lectures. Uh, you know, uh, I will not sort of fixate on it. I think it's, it's, you know, historians have dealt with this issue, but if someone has specific questions, I'd be glad to. But, but this is something that I'll be addressing next time, but more so in the third lecture, which is exclusively on the relationship between science and religion. Can you just please define for me, the reason for our on what religious science is? Because I think about natural The word for science in Arabic is alm, which means knowledge. And usually you use the word alm in construct with something else. You say the alm, the science of, the knowledge of, literally, but, or the science of, whatever it is. So religious science is a system of knowledge which deals with religious subjects, as opposed to rational sciences, which was used, the term was used. I mean, th these, are, these are terms which are, I'm using terms which were actually used by, you know, 
in, in, in the current practices uh, uh, in, in, the, in the classical period, and even today. The rational ulum al the rational sciences, or uh, you could be more specific, you will say al uh, tabiai the science of, uh, of nature, or which we now call physics, uh, or you could say whatever, you know, the science of weights, the science of uh, uh, hadith, the traditions of the prophet, the science of law, of, uh, of applied law, and so on and so forth. So these are the, the you know, the, the, the term itself is knowledge, and it applies everywhere, but the distinction was quite clear. Well, it's not quite clear, actually. The distinction, uh, and again, this is something that I will talk about. I mean, the way the distinction was negotiated, it's, it didn't really, you know, it's not clear cut always. And there are changes that happen over time. Uh, but by and large, there are general sort of practices which are distinguished from each other. And these are categorized. I mean, these general practices are, on the one hand, the traditional religious disciplines, if you will, which were called the religious sciences and the rational sciences. I don't know if I answered your question, but I'll be saying much more about this next time and the panel. Thanks very much, Professor Dulaf, for your very enlightening uh, lecture. Uh, my question actually starts with a remark uh, from Franz Rosenthal that we just heard, uh, which uh, I find very interesting. And it reminds me of an article that the young Shlomo Pines published in 1938 about the relationship in this case between, uh, uh, and the, the survival in this case of of philosophy and sciences after the 12th century, which were by and large regarded dead before that time. There in the article of 1938, he makes the point that uh, in Islam, the sciences uh, are characterized largely by a syntactic attitude, in this case, bringing together different traditions from the Greeks, from, from the Hellenistic uh, world, of course, from India, from Babylonia, and all that, and he somewhat uh, um, he somewhat contrasts that with scientific attitude in, in Europe. And I don't know whether we would like to, con to comment on that. In this case, I just want to you know, more or less uh, invite you to... How does he contrast that to Europe? In what way? Well, that's of course something that he doesn't go into that in, in, the, in that article very, very closely. But what he just says is what characterizes Islamic sciences and the pursuit of Islamic sciences is particular this idea of basically bringing together and, and consciously apparently, consciously wanting to bring together uh, different traditions. And, yeah, well, and I just want to invite as I, you to... As I, as I said in my argument, I think the, the multiplicity of traditions was quite instrumental. Not so much in, 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 in the, that they had equal weight, they didn't. I mean, the Greek tradition was by far much more influential than any other tradition. And for understandable reasons, it was much more systematic, it was more, you know, it, and, and so on and so forth. It was, you know, a coherent system, uh, which is, uh, you know, which appealed to the, and, and had much more influence in the, but I think my, my argument is that the multiplicity of traditions uh, enabled a, a posture towards, you know, towards the, the sciences that were being imported, which is a critical posture. Right from the beginning, there was an awareness that they, you have choices. And again, we see, it, we see it in astronomy, we see it in mathematics, we see it in medicine, we see it in all the traditions, and from the earliest period. So there is an awareness that there are multiple traditions. And with this awareness, you don't take a tradition, you know, in awe completely and just accept it as is. You're willing to think it over. You're willing to question it to some extent. This is number one. And secondly, I agree with you. I agree with if, if you know with, uh, with what you attributed to, uh, to to the article that uh, there was a in, in many instances there was a deliberate application of one discipline to another discipline, leading to the creation of of a third discipline. In the, in the mathematical disciplines, this is very, very clear. I mean, you know, the application of arithmetic and geometry and, and, uh, and algebra. Uh, the, the applying them to each other, in every instance, invariably led to the creation of a new field. Uh, but th there is more. I mean, the, the application of algebra to, uh, to, uh, to statics uh, and the creation of the science of weights and, and so on and so forth. I mean, it's not just in, in, in one discipline. Um, so the, the, the intentional cross-application is also, very, so the hybridity is, I think, important for this critical sort of approach to the, to the imported legacies. And the cross-application is critical for, is important for the invention of new scientific traditions. And both were quite, quite significant, I, I, you know, in, in the practice of science. 